So, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verses 36 to 40, begin with, Arjun said, Now, propelled by whom does this person commit sin, even not wanting to, O Krishna, as though impelled by force? The Blessed Lord said, this is desire, this is anger, born of the guna called rajas, consumer of much, very evil, know it to be your enemy here in the world. As fire is veiled by smoke, or a mirror is by dust, as a fetus is covered with placenta, so is this world of activities covered by desire. It is by this eternal enemy of the wise that knowledge is covered, the insatiable fire in the form of desire, O son of Kunti. The senses, mind and intellect are its resort. It is by these that it covers knowledge and confuses the body-bearing one. Arjun asks a question that any one of us would have asked. Why do we commit sin or that those karma or those actions that are not very useful, not very healthy, those that are not along with dharma, even though we don't really want to, we all know that feeling. We know it very well. You are in a situation where you do not want to give in to certain negative traits or qualities that you have in you, but you cannot help yourself. We all know this. There may be times where you experience jealousy because somebody else does something better than you or has something that you would like to have. And you don't want to experience jealousy. But you cannot help it. It is beyond your control. You find yourself maybe doing certain action, though you know it is not right. You are still a prisoner of these deep habit patterns. And you are impelled, as it says here, as, as by force. And what is it, he asks, what is it that makes us do these actions? And the answer is desire. Desire, karma, is the root of all this. Just as fire is veiled by smoke, so all these worldly activities are covered by desire. So the knowledge that is in us, deep within us, is buried and it is covered by the smoke screen of desire. Desire is called the enemy here. But it's not in the sense of enemy as in something really negative, but it is enemy in the sense of that which is against knowledge. Desire takes away from knowledge. The worldly activities take away from worldly knowledge. So this, these worldly activities prevent you from gaining true knowledge. And this is what desire does. It's a smoke screen. The senses, buddhi, mind, are all blunted or covered. They cannot clearly see through this smoke screen. 
So it says in the last verse, the senses, the mind and the intellect. These are all covered. Cannot see through clearly, cannot see the knowledge. And this confuses the body-bearing one. Who's the body-bearing? Who bears the body? It is the self. The Atman is the body-bearer. And so, the senses, the mind and even the intellect is a part of that duality or a part of that smoke screen. So even if buddhi is a part of the smoke screen, how, uh, how is it possible for us to get out of this? In spite of the fact that buddhi is a part of this duality, we need to sharpen the buddhi. In the Yoga Vashishta, it's a beautiful verse or example that is given where it says that just as a thorn is used to remove a thorn, so you need to use the mind to remove or come overcome the mind. So we need to have a sharpened buddhi in order to go beyond this screen of created by desire, the screen of worldly activities which is created by desire. Desire is often put down by everybody as so negative, but we need to understand this desire. Just as a thorn is used to remove a thorn, so too, with desire. You need to understand desire so you can use that desire and work with that desire to overcome desire. Merely to put down desire as something bad and evil is not very useful. When desire is fulfilled, it creates pride, it creates greed. You want more. When the desire is not fulfilled, it creates anger, it creates jealousy. Either way, whether the desire is fulfilled or not fulfilled, it will create egoism, a sense of identity is strengthened in us. And that takes us further away from true knowledge. So we need to understand this process that these desires, they are present because you have them. And because you have them, you are here in this plane. You are here to fulfill those desires. So it may seem paradoxical. How can I overcome the desires if that is the reason why I'm here? So we need to resolve that problem. The greater desires swallow the smaller desires. So the desire from free, for freedom from this cycle of birth, death and rebirth will swallow all your other smaller desires eventually. We need to strengthen this particular desire. So that's a process we need to go through, knowing ourselves, understanding our own desires and how we can resolve these conflicting desires and use the power of desire itself to free us from this cycle of birth, death and rebirth. This approach towards karma or desire is the approach of shaktas, shakti. Ours is a, is a shakti tradition, a shakta tradition and therefore we accept that desires is why we are here in this plane and how can we use these desires so they do not create obstacles for us. If these worldly activities, 
are creating a smoke screen so that we not see the true light, the true knowledge within, then how can we remove these desires or these worldly activities? How do we resolve them so that we can see the true knowledge within? That's a process that we go through by understanding, knowing ourselves, knowing our own desires and working with these desires. When that happens, the world is no longer an obstacle, it's no longer maya, then the world is shakti. And that's the difference between maya and shakti. It's in fact one and the same. It's the perspective that differs. We no longer see the world as an obstacle, but as beautiful play of consciousness. That is shakti. So, good so far? Any questions? We don't have to have questions just because I ask if you have questions. But if you have something, please go ahead. Okay, seems to be pretty clear. Verse 41. Therefore, first control the senses, O Arjuna. Abandon this evil that destroys knowledge and the experience of spiritual realities. So Krishna continues and he guides and he gives him the answer how should I proceed? Where do I begin? And Krishna responds with absolute simple answer and he says begin with the senses. Often when we embark on the spiritual path many of us read many intellectual philosophical books things like Advaita in particular and we do not necessarily want to do any practice or there are those of us who believe that doing complicated practices somehow seems to help. The reality is quite different as is explained here by Sri Krishna. Begin first with the senses. It's the most easy path to take. One does not begin with the ego. What would happen if you begin with ego? If you try to work with ahankara, an impure ahankara, you are setting yourself up for failure. Why? Because an impure ahankara can be very, very tricky and is very, very powerful. Imagine yourself, you've just learned how to drive a car. And just after you get your license, you sit down in a Porsche or in a Mercedes or, a, or let's say a Ferrari, a very powerful car. What's going to happen? You're not skilled enough, experienced enough to drive such a powerful car. You're probably going to destroy the car. So, what do you begin with? You begin with that which is the easiest and the simplest. You begin with the senses. You learn to observe the senses. You learn to train them, to convince them, to coordinate them. So, 
So this is why Sri Krishna says, first, control the senses. Control may not be a, necessarily a very positive word for us these days, but uh, more appropriate would be to coordinate the senses, to convince them, to train them. So when the mind is not continuously going outwards, if you're not jumping from one thing to the other, you know, continuously, the mind is feasting on the external objects. We talked in the earlier sessions in chapter 3 that the objects of the world are known as food. That's all food. That's why we call the first kosha, the annamaya kosha. So the, the senses are feeding on, on this external stimulus or stimuli, which is food. They're feasting on this. So how do you work with that? You, if you're continuously going outwards, how can you find that knowledge within you? You cannot. So abandon that path, which is outward going, leading you further away from knowledge. Train the senses so that they go within and experience deeper spiritual realities. Okay, good. Any questions on this verse? By evil, he is, re is he referring to desire? Abandon this evil that destroys knowledge is the outward moving path. The path is referring with together with the senses. Okay. Yes. So it is that tendency in all of us to go outward. You know, as I said, to feed on the, the feast of external objects, the smoke screen of worldly activities. And so it refers to as abandon that path. Abandon that path which is moving externally. Okay. Gautam, you wanted to say something? Uh, uh, Rathakaji, I was just wondering in this, uh, while the coordination of the senses is happening, uh, during this coordination, uh, is there not a certain ego also at play? Uh, I'm wondering that can, the, uh, can this bad ego or the certain ego uh, take that... Uh, uh, with the feeling that yes, it's coordinated. I don't know whether I'm able to express. Uh, uh, was I able to you know, get my question over to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> we'll find out <laughs> when I answer you. Um, yes, there may be an element of ego where you think that you have um, managed to coordinate and train the senses, but um, when it is purely coming from ego, then there is going to be no progress. There's going to be no or little progress. As I said, that uh, ego is very tricky. So, Ankara will come into any and every place. So, coordination of the senses, training of the senses itself um, requires a certain guidance from a teacher. Very few, very rare souls have managed to go down this path entirely on their own. And I must emphasize that, that the modern students do not necessarily want to have guidance or teachers. They're very happy reading books and uh, looking at websites and videos um, and becoming followers of... <laughs> um, I don't know, large uh, organizations or where they may get little or no guidance. But the reality is that the senses itself are themselves having deep habit patterns, external movement, you know. As I said in my response to Shanta's question, the 
tendency is so strong. It has been created not only in this lifetime, but over many lifetimes. It is, in fact, the, the way this world has come about. The world exists because we go outwards, because we have desires. We have, at this plane, we are here to manifest these desires. So naturally, that is the tendency. What you're doing is wanting to reverse this. And that is by no means an easy task. Therefore, little guidance is required initially. Otherwise, as you mentioned, the ego element, the angara, can creep in without a teacher to guide you, to caution you, to point out these uh, traps of the ego. That can end up with a student losing many, many years and, and needless suffering. You know, that's, that's what's going to happen if you continue down that path. So some amount of um, guidance is required there to caution against the ego. Very few people have such a sharp buddhi that they can do it themselves. Because if you have such a sharp buddhi that you can train yourself, then basically the sense is already trained. All you need is a sharp buddhi. But as I said, that's a higher level already. The first step is learning to observe the senses, guiding them, training them, convincing them. Coordinating them. Different words, but they have a subtlety of meaning to them. Okay, I hope that helps, Gautam. Because the ego is such a thing, Ankara is such a thing that there is not, uh, you know, there are many traps there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, then we continue. Two verses, I think these are the last verses, yes, in chapter 3. The senses are said to be powerful. Beyond the senses is the mind. Beyond the mind is intellect. The one beyond the intellect, however, is the self. Thus, awakening to the one who is beyond intellect holding and supporting self by the self, destroy this elusive enemy in the form of desire, O mighty armed one. So Sri Krishna now outlines the path itself. In the verse before, he said, okay, here it is, this is where you start. You start with the senses. Now he's outlining the path itself. So he says, the senses, beyond the senses is the mind, after the mind is the intellect, and beyond the intellect is the self, the higher self, Atman. So you see, it goes from gross to subtle. I'd like to complete Krishna, and I always ask for questions at the end of the explanation. So, you can ask your question at the end of this explanation. So, that's outlining the path from gross to subtle. And that's exactly the reverse of what is generally happening. I mentioned in that question that Shanta asked, and I said, yes, we are always going outwards. That's the general tendency. Now we need to reverse it and go from senses to mind to intellect and to one beyond. What is mind here? Mind here is the general term for the antakarna. It includes ego, it includes manas, it includes you know, chitta and then intellect. Your intellect is buddhi, that sharp discriminative sense in us. So it takes us through all these from the gross to the subtle, to the subtle most. 
And this is the path we need to take to destroy the elusive enemy of desire. Desire, just another word for samskaras. This is the approach, this is the systematic path. If you do not follow the systematic path, you're not going to reach the subtle most. There is no other path you can take. If you do not take this path, you are going to be lost in the world, in the worldly objects, and not find your way back. So this path, the outward moving path, is known as pravritti mark. The inward moving path is known as nivritti mark. Both are important. Both are important. The first one that moves outward, the reason the world exists, that you want to you are here because you want to, to live out your desires. Let and allow the samskaras to play out in this world. It's important because that's why you're here. But the second part, the inward moving part, is also important. That's also the reason why you're here. Because you want to evolve. You want to grow. You want to develop. You want to overcome your suffering. You want to go beyond all these cycles of birth, death and rebirth. And be free. Attain moksha. So both the parts are important. Pravritti mark as well as nivritti mark. Both are important. Therefore, our tradition respects both these and says this is the complete path, Purnamarg, where you do both. Those who reject the external world and only want to go inward, that is the path of non-dualism. The only problem with non-dualistic path, pure Advaita, is that as long as you have a body, you have to deal with the world around you. And so, that can become mere intellectual philosophy. So we need to do both. We cannot reject nor ignore or neglect the world and our body. So desire itself is not bad. It's not, though it is referred to here as the enemy, is referred to as the enemy in the sense of that which is against the flow of knowledge. Think of it as a stream which is flowing down, you know, you go downstream towards the sea. What you are trying to do is swim upstream. You're going back to the source of the river. It's very hard, as most of you know, maybe you have not tried to swim upstream. <laughs> uh, very unlikely, I think. Most people um, don't swim in rivers and definitely don't swim upstream. But if you would ever try to swim anywhere against the current, you know that it's almost impossible, depending on, of course, how strong the current is. But this is, in fact, what we are trying to do. The current of prana, energy, is always moving outwards, and we are trying to reverse it and go inwards. And that is the way how we can awaken ourselves. So that is the systematic approach from gross to subtle. To know your own desires, do not consider them to be something evil, but learn how we can minimize them, how we can 
focus them so that they are swallowed by the higher desire for enlightenment, for freedom. And uh, learn to live in the world yet above it. The path of Advaita Dvaita. Both dualism as well as non-dualism. Alright, so that was the very last verse of chapter 3. Any questions? Hi. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, this came in when you were discussing the intellect as, you know, there's intellect as a level behind the mind in the path of, you know, when you're going from gross to subtle. But this refers to only the buddhi, right? So there, it could be that uh, someone is like, you know, very intellectual in the normal sense, very, how to say, who like solving puzzles, who, who seeks the scientific knowledge, but that is still in the level of manas, I assume. That is still in the level of mind where it is actually taking you away from. It's closer to the body than to the real intellect here. The word intellect is, is not a very good translation of buddhi. We have to deal with the fact that we are not probably going to find a very good translation for the word buddhi. The word buddhi has many translations. I, I prefer sometimes to use uh, inner wisdom. Uh, intuition can also be misunderstood. Uh, inner voice uh, gives you the feeling that you know you're getting uh, uh, schizophrenic and starting to talk to yourself. So we are stuck with, with the translation. Therefore, I have always said it's best to just use the word buddhi. And the word buddhi is connected to buddha, bodha, which comes from light, awakening. It has absolutely nothing to do with an intellectual person who is maybe good at studies, good at reading, good in academics, good in science, mathematics, or all those intellectual fears. Has absolutely nothing to do with that. Think of it more as light of, of awareness. Maybe awareness is uh, simply a better word, closer to, um, to really what buddhi actually means. Simply to be aware, to pay attention. So, yeah, so my question was mainly about uh, basically the problems that exist with any other desires also exist with the desire of so-called knowledge, uh, so-called uh, scientific knowledge. So it's the same, is what I was asking. It's the same as all the other problems of manas. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, it's all duality. Okay. So we come to chapter 4. That is Jhana Karma Sanyasa Yoga. Chapter 4 takes us now to a different level in chapter 3, we talked more about karma and samskaras and the relationship between the two. And now we go a step beyond, talk about jhana karma sannyasa yoga, which means talk about the knowledge behind it and the actions and how we can become a little bit more detached or gain uh, distance to, to our actions. The Blessed Lord said, I taught this immutable yoga to Vivasvat. Vivasvat taught it to Manu. Manu taught it to Ekash. 
पर रखूँ रॉयल सेजेस न्यू दिस योगा एज इट वॉज हैंडेड डाउन इन द लीनियज ऑफ द ट्रडिशन देन ओवर अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम दिस योगा डिसअपियर ओ स्कॉचर ऑफ एनिमीज दैट वेरी एंशियंट योगा आई हैव टॉट यू टूडे एज यू आर माई डेवोटी एज वेल एज माई फ्रेंड दिस इज द हाइस्ट सीक्रेट so shri krishna is talking about a lineage here this parampara that we talk about there have been actually two kinds earlier the lineage was from father to son you know it was a brahmanical lineage the brahmans as we know most of us know were custodians of knowledge but over time they became custodians of scriptural knowledge which what it means is they had the information and they did not necessarily have the direct knowledge what happened was that they became custodians holding that information or the knowledge of the scriptures but they did not necessarily have a direct experience of what was taught in those scriptures so over time the lineage of yoga the yoga lineage the yoga parampara shifted from being a lineage from father to son to a lineage of teacher or master master to student in the early earlier times the lineage was strictly male dominated but eventually when the shift took place based on qualification it became much more secular in the sense that now the only thing that counted was merit it was not restricted to the first born son or to the sons it didn't matter one who was qualified could attain that knowledge that wisdom and so you had cases of the great rishi rishis of the Upanishads, for example, uh, a young boy comes to the sage Gautam and says, "Will you teach me? I want to learn. I want to have knowledge, wisdom." And the, the rishi asks, "Who is your father?" And he says, "I do not know. My mother said that." she does know who the father was so call yourself jabala so he's, he he took her name instead of his and so everybody else advised gautam not to take that student because for all you know he may not be a brahmin but the great sage gautam said that you have spoken the truth shows that you are a brahmin so the qualification was a sign and not birth so the lineage changed as i said and became that of master to student and this was handed down but over a period of time this yoga disappeared or scorched of enemies what does that mean why is shri krishna calling arjun scorcher of enemies puratana Puratana, scorcher of enemies, the one who burns the enemy. What is what is the enemy here? Ignorance. Ignorance is the enemy, and Arjun will burn away ignorance. And this, over a period of time, this tradition disappeared. He said. That was the time when the Brahmanical. 
lineage became very ritualistic. It was corrupted and became a form of complete ritualism. It was revived and from these came the Upanishads and the shift took place from lineages based on birth to lineage based on qualification. And thus he says, I am teaching you this because you are a devotee and friend. So he is not the son. Arjun is not his son. He is a distant relative, but above all, he is a friend. So he is a student and friend. We have mentioned this earlier, and I would like to emphasize that the concept of friendship is very important, not only in our tradition, but with reference to the Bhagavad Gita itself, with the reference to the Mahabharata, great deal of emphasis has been placed on the friendship between Sri Krishna and Arjuna. And the reason is that these two symbolize the aspects of mind and consciousness. And unless we learn to approach the mind as a friend, we are not going to be able to go beyond the mind. From the Yoga Vashishta we know that a thorn is used to remove another thorn from the body, from the foot. So, to overcome the mind or to go beyond the mind, we need to make the mind our friend. The relationship between a master and a student is not that of a superior or an inaccessible, unapproachable teacher, but that of close friendship. It is not a friendship like most of us know, uh, you know, hanging out together and, uh, you know, doing silly things, as most of us would do, but the teacher is a revered friend. There has to be respect for the teacher. If you do not respect your teacher, it's not likely that you are going to learn anything from the teacher. So, he is teaching because he is a good student as well as a friend. So they have developed a good relationship. Okay, good so far. Any questions? We continue to verses 4 to 6 of chapter 4. Arjun said, Your birth was later, and the birth of Vivasvat much earlier. How shall I understand this? That you taught it in the beginning? The blessed Lord said, Many births of mine have passed, and so have yours, O Arjuna. I know them all, but you do not know them, O scorcher of enemies. Though unborn, the immutable self, he, being even the Lord of beings, yet I incarnate with my own power, having perfect control over my prakriti. So Arjun, quite understandably, is a little bit confused since Sri Krishna talked about teachers like Vivasvat who preceded Krishna sages who came much earlier, before Krishna. So he is not naturally a little bit confused. How is it possible for Krishna to have taught them? Krishna does not identify with that mortal body. He is identifying with pure consciousness or his 
Atman. He also has, through meditation, through awakening, he remembers previous births. So he says, I know my births, I know all of them. Many have passed and I know them. I know them, but you don't. Arjuna is still ignorant. He is a scorcher of enemies. He is ready to burn away his ignorance, but he hasn't done so yet. So Sri Krishna says, I am aware of these past births. He identifies with pure consciousness. Therefore, he was there already long before. And though unborn, the immutable self, he has identification not only to his individual Atman, but also to the cosmic self, the cosmic self, universal self. And therefore he has knowledge of all the different lives and worlds that, of course, other mortals do not. And so he incarnates and having perfect control over Prakriti, having perfect control over his grosser aspects of reality. Control does not mean control as we understand control, but having mastery over these. Okay? This may be a little bit difficult to understand, the idea of rebirths, uh, many births before and having knowledge of these. Um, understandable for those who do not have that experience or memory or have not been able to recall past lives. It shall always remain a mystery, I guess, until you yourself have that direct experience. And even having a memory or recalling past lives, possibly you may never be ever certain that that really happened or not. Any questions regarding these three verses? So we come to verses 7 and 8, and <clears throat> these two verses are among some of the most famous verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And Sri Krishna says, Whenever there is a diminution of dharma, O descendant of Bharata, and a rise of unrighteousness, then I incarnate myself forth for the protection of the good, for the destruction of the evildoers, for the purpose of establishing dharma. I incarnate myself from age to age. So here Sri Krishna assures Arjun, who is uh, representing all sincere sadhakas, that he, Sri Krishna, who is basically the divine self, the cosmic self, will incarnate for the protection of the good and for destruction of the evil good, evildoers. It is an assurance that 
there will always be these teachings. They will always be available. They will not die out. Many students are sometimes concerned, especially these days, with the rising materialism, with the rise of materialistic, materialistic values. There's a concern that spiritual values, lineages, traditions of meditation will disappear. That a dharma will arise, unrighteousness will become stronger. And that is possible. There has been time and again, there have been these cycles. And throughout modern history, modern history of yoga, I would say, which by, by which I mean, not in a cosmic sense, but in historical sense, if we take from the times of the Veda, where the traditions disintegrated into mere ritualism, out of those ashes of ritualism came the fine, sublime, profound wisdom of the Upanishads. When these once again disintegrated into intellectual debating and philosophizing between the followers of Buddha Dharma and the rest of Sanatana Dharma, came the sublime philosophy of Advaita that was revived by Adi Shankara. When certain forces from the West took over parts of Northern India and eventually whole of India, Sanatana Dharma went underground. A lot of that deep wisdom was lost or buried for many, many centuries and has only recently been revived just in the last few decades. And these traditions, these lineages have become once again active. Or now in the more recent times, we find that yoga itself has been commercialized and has been made extremely physical oriented and as a backlash there are people who say this is not right we are going away from the true yoga tradition we need to get back to the core so these kind of movements and revivalism has been a pattern throughout history and that will continue we do not need to fear that this will die out completely and that there will always be this knowledge alive. It is like a fire, you know, that may have gone out, but the ember, you know, that continues to burn. Just need to blow on it a little bit and it turns into a raging fire again. So, these verses are verses that give us assurance and confidence and courage that these fine values and the sublime truths will not die out. They are immortal and eternal. Okay, any questions about that? 
Any comments? Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, do the concept of these avatars or this reincarnation have any significance with the, you know, with the internal part? Do they have any symbolism? Because in the internal part, generally, that the teachings are always available. So, do, does the idea of avatars and you know, uh, occasionally uh, Krishna or someone coming back, does it have any significance in the internal part? Does it have any symbolism there? Uh, I don't know quite what you mean by the internal part, but of course, as I said, there will always be these teachings. And if they manifest through the form of a teacher who was perhaps called Sri Krishna or to a teacher known as Adi Shankara or any other avatars like Buddha uh, was also considered to be an avatar, um, that will always happen. And two teachings will be available to some form or the other. There's a teacher who will um, revive these teachings. I'm not too sure what you mean by internal path, but um, they will manifest in, in some form. Okay, so yeah, so uh, my question is more about it's generally the stories are like he will be come back in this particular time and stuff like that. So, uh, because uh, what we are used to is more about that the teachings are always there and the teacher will always there be there when you need them and are ready for it. So, yeah, anyway, so uh, it's not that important. It's just a curious question. Okay. If it's not important, then maybe you should not bring it up. All right. So, sure. um, it's already time to stop. Is there anybody who wants to say something, share, ask questions, then go ahead. If not, then maybe we can stop here. Okay, so we will have our next meeting on Sunday, Mastering Pranayam, we continue, and um, have a nice weekend, everybody, it was nice having you after a long time back to our meetings, so see you on Sunday, bye-bye. Bye, bye thank you. Bye-bye, thank you, Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.